Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. It is Friday. Friday's it's good to be Friday. Oh no, we're almost out of water. A little bit tired today. I um, was out relatively late last night. Had a little bit of wine, probably too much, but um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I had a, a meeting with a bunch of my mentors and it was like a, a dinner meeting, a dinner, dinner party. So a little bit out of it, a little bit tired, a little bit hungover, but you know, that's how it goes every once in a while. Today, oh gosh, number one tournament tip. Look, I had to reset my computer just a second ago because it wasn't functioning properly. So I have no notes for today, so we're going to wing it. What am I even talking about today? Number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. Okay, you ready for it? Do you know what it is? Take your time. Think about it. Also, go to my Twitter, uh, Jonathan or twitter.com slash Jonathan Little, and uh, we're giving away an $1,100 buy-in to a card player poker tour tournament. It's completely free to enter. You might as well. So um, go get in that while you're thinking of the number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. What is happening here? Like everything is off. I, I, I don't do a little coffee one day and everything, everything gets messed up. All right, here we go. We're fixing it. All right. The number one tip is to continuation bet tiny. You're probably like, oh, I already knew that. Well, what a lot of people do very wrong is they be a little bit too tight pre-flop and then they bake bets that are way too big on the flop. What you should be doing is you should be raising probably a little bit more often than you think. And then you should be continuation betting small, a large portion of the time. Now, if I had to say across the board, as a blanket strategy, if I had to teach you to play poker tournaments tomorrow and you've never played poker, I would give you a preflop range chart and then I would have you continuation bet for about 25% pot on every flop. You're gonna be making some mistakes, but in general, people fold way too often. So whenever you bet tiny, minimum defense frequency is uh, what, 80%? Something like that. So if minimum defense frequency is 80%, they're clearly not gonna defend anywhere near minimum defense frequency, right? Is YouTube not working? I believe YouTube's working. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash YouTube. Seems like it's working. Um, my Facebook comments have not been working the last few days. So I don't know what's up with Facebook comments. Just so all of you know, if you're on Facebook trying to talk to me, I'm not seeing them. I don't know why. You need to go to YouTube or Twitch or Twitter or anywhere else. YouTube is working, everyone's saying. Okay, good. All right, so... As Pavlo says, the only problem is that increases the bluffing frequency. But who cares? The opponents fold too often. It is A-OK -okay to bluff too often with a bluffing frequency that is too high if your opponents fold too often, which they will. They will. I promise you they will. Unless they're just like extreme calling stations. Now, listen, if they're extreme calling stations, you're going to find that a lot of them will call every small flop bet Call some turn bets, but then usually fold out a lot on the river. Now, if your opponent is just a super calling station, stop bluffing, right? This is not a discussion on how to beat super calling stations. This is a discussion on how to beat the games in general. Now, if all of the people in your games are super calling stations, then this won't work. But for the most part, people will defend too wide. Maybe not even too wide, because you actually should be defending your blinds decently often. But they'll defend very poorly. They will call preflop. Then they'll check fold a lot of flops. And even if they check fold a little bit, say they check fold like 40% of the time, that is way too much because they're supposed to be defending with 80% of their range. And to be fair, they're not actually supposed to be defending with 80% of their range because usually they're getting good odds pre-flop. So they don't have to defend at the minimum defense frequency, but you get to make an essentially free profitable bluff over and over and over and over, and over again for a small size. Now, as your opponents get better, they're going to start calling small bets more often, okay? That's just gonna happen. 
Because they should. They realize, all right, I'm getting great odds. They're either going to start calling a lot or they're going to start raising a lot or some combination of that. So what does that mean? Well, if they're going to be calling a lot with a wide, that presumes they have a wide range. In that scenario, you get to continue bluffing them on the turn. Realize they're going to get to the turn with wide ranges. So if they get to the flop or get to the turn with wide ranges, then you should very often continue barreling them. And again, your bluffing frequency will be out of whack. You'll have too many bluffs in your range. But that's fine because people fold too often. So you always want to ask, am I trying to exploit my opponents and what am I trying to actually accomplish? And the idea of I need to be balanced, especially against non-pros, not very good opponents, is asinine. So many people think in their minds that I'm supposed to try to play like a GTO robot. And if you do that, you're just going to spew money all over, all over the place. Always adjust to what your opponents do wrong. And in general, people do not stick around often enough, especially in these small and medium stakes games. Um, Polly says, what if they're limpers? Well, that's not what we're discussing, right, Polly? Be very, very aware that we're discussing a specific scenario where you raise and somebody calls. That's the spot where you want to be making small continuation bets frequently. Obviously, it's not perfect. I have extensive videos at pokercoaching.com discussing when to continuation bet and how much. So recognize this is a very, very easy strategy. This is to help people who are, or don't want to study a ton, but want to you know, be able to beat the players they're very likely to be playing against. Um, so this is a very, very simple strategy that will work quite well, especially when you're in position. Obviously, when you're out of position, you probably need to develop a little bit more balanced strategy. But even then, betting small frequently isn't even that bad because, again, people fold too often. The times when betting small starts to get a little bit dicey is when you're going to get raised a lot because then you have to figure out what raising range to there or what, what the raising range is, right? And if they're going to be folding or if they're, they're going to be check raising very frequently, you have to start sticking around very frequently, right? And to be fair, whenever you do raise and then continuation bet small, when you don't have the range advantage, they should be check raising you a lot because they have the range advantage or they have the nut advantage, right? Usually you're going to have the range advantage, but very often you don't have the nut advantage. Good example of this to so say you raise middle position, big blind calls, it comes 866. Six. Well, who has more sixes in their range, right? Obviously the big blind defending player, right? They check, you can make that small 25% pop bet, and they should be raising you a lot here. And again, as a default, simplest, uh, like a blanket strategy for them, they should probably check raise you very frequently. Because what does their range look like? Well, it's either total garbage that they can just fold, or it's gonna be stuff like. Uh, three of a kind, which is great, or top pair, which doesn't really mind protection. And then it's going to be a lot of stuff like draws, and those draws don't mind if you fold. And the fact that they have a lot of sixes in their range makes it easy for them to have at least a somewhat protected range because they have some trips there. So, anyway, most people don't do that. Give someone 8-5 on, uh, well, nine. give them 9-5 on the 8-6-6 board. They're not raising very often. They're just check folding, but they should be raising. Give them a 7-4 seven, seven, there for a gut shot. They should be raising. Give them um, king, king 7 for backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw. They should be raising. Yet people don't. They just fold too often. What is the topic for today? The topic for today is the number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. And it is to continuation bet very frequently, perhaps 100% of the time, and using a tiny sizing. And then you have to be able to adjust to whatever they're going to do incorrectly, and that usually means following up with a lot of turn bluffs. Now, if there are a bunch of limpers and you raise with your hand, and then all the limpers call, you don't want to be continuation betting frequently because someone's going to have something. Um, that said, it's probably okay to still bet whenever you should have the range advantage, but realize that if you see the flop four or five ways, someone's going to have something. So if someone has something, you just don't want to be bluffing in that scenario. So, another very, very good tip for those who somehow play in games where there are lots of limpers. Um, you just mostly want to be raising for straight value. You don't want to be raising them as a bluff too often unless they're going to limp fold a ton. And then also, you want to be playing probably a little bit more straightforwardly than you would think on the flop. Stuff like middle pair, if it goes bet call or bet raise, it always needs to be folded. Don't call thinking that you have some outs because very often you don't. Also... Um, in scenarios where 
you have a top pair. Say you raise, four people call, you have king, queen. It comes like uh, king, ten, three. Okay? Let's say you continuation bet with your top pair, which, first off, checking could be fine. Say you do bet, though, and get raised, you probably just want to fold. I know it sounds nitty, but a lot of these players, remember, they fold too often. They do not frequently raise unless they have a very good hand, right? So against players who play straightforwardly, listen to them. Carlton says, how small of a continuation bet are we talking about? About 25% pot. Does this apply to smaller buy-in daily tournaments or for high buy-in tournaments? Both. It applies for non-professionals. Does he have any work for the big blind ante format? Most tournaments are big blind ante now. And bit realize big blind ante is not different than what we used to play. It's just, it just changes who puts in the money on any individual scenario. I do have a YouTube video though. Um, just search it on YouTube, Jonathan Little, adjusting to the big blind ante. Veronica Angry Pollock, good morning. Very, very early for you, I suppose. Must be 6 a.m. there, goodness gracious. Thanks for all the work on the uh, postal case. I know it takes lots of courage to say something like that when, in theory, you could be wrong, right? But it's pretty clear you're not. <laughs> and um, hopefully Mac Versandig and uh, the rest of the poker world and the judicial system does not let all of you down. Um, 8 a.m. in Texas. Yes, that's how time zones, time zones work. It's 6 a.m. on the West Coast right now. Very, very early. I don't know what time it is in um, Australia. I know there's some Australians over watching. I know there's some people in Europe and South America, all over the place. A few people from China are watching. Every, everyone, everyone's here. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, number one strategy, bet frequently and small. What are my thoughts on GTO? Do you study it? Obviously, if you're a good poker player, you must learn how to play fundamentally sound. That's not what we're discussing right now, though. We're discussing how to beat the non-pros. There should be a title for the stream. Number one, tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. Definitely, though, if you want to succeed long-term, you have to learn more than just very simple strategies, right? Raising, continuation betting small frequently is great against the non-pros, but it's not going to work against pros because they are going to recognize the right ways to adjust, right? Let's get some more time zone chat here. We have someone from Sweden. Good morning. 10 p.m. in South Korea. Midnight in Melbourne. We have a... I don't know, it's going to sound bad. You can see I don't even know what this flag is. What's a red flag? Red, red, red top, bottom, white flag. Someone can tell me that. I'm very, very bad at... Um, Flags, you'd think I'd be good at flags because it's like a lot of just memorization, but uh, never really learned the flags. That's a Poland, Polish flag, all right. Is that a Polish flag? All right, cool. You all know the flags better than I do. Poland's fantastic. Have I been to Poland? I don't know if I've actually been to Poland. I've been, I think I went through the airport one time. I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter. We are getting so off topic here. Like I said, I'm a little bit hungover from, the, uh, from my party last night. Um, being bad at flags is hugely in your poker game. You know, some people actually uh, take an immense amount of pride in getting caches in various um, countries. I never really got that, but some people, they like, they're flag hunters. They travel to random tournament series just to have a flag on their Hinden Mob or Global Poker Index database. All the Polish people are going to be just furiously angry at me. Funny enough, uh, that's where my father-in-law is from, so uh, you'd think I would have known that. Whenever you um, have too much to drink and you wake up too early, turns out your brain doesn't work very well. Um... Ordinary man says you cash in the USA. Congrats. <laughs> so, what if you're playing against someone who is frequently continuation betting small, like I just suggested all of you do? Well, first thing first, realize that you need to stick around a lot. Not the minimum defense frequency, but still a lot. And... 
for example, it, it depends a lot on the on the board and the board's texture, right? On boards that should be good for your range as the caller, which varies. It's not some people think it's only the middle cards that are good for you. That's not true. Sometimes low cards are good for you, especially when you're in the big blind. Sometimes middle cards are good for you, especially when you're in the big blind or like button or cutoff. Sometimes high cards are good for you when like under the gun raises and you call uh, from second position, right? You should have mostly very good big cards. So in scenarios like this, those are times where you should be sticking around very frequently. That was the Indonesian flag. That's the Indonesian flag. All right, Poland is reversed. Ha <laughs> ha, look at all that. I'm not, I, I, to be fair, I didn't know which, what Poland was either, either way. So that's the Indonesian flag, nice. Our Galloway, genius over here, knows his flags. He probably pulled up Google and consulted Google to find the Indonesian flag. Um, anyway, recognize which boards are good for your range and which boards are not, right? Because some boards are great for you and some boards are not great for you. So in situations where the board is good for you, you do need to be sticking around very, very frequently. Now, when you have just total garbage, you can fold. Like say under the gun raises, you call in middle position and then the flop, you have like eight, seven suited, right? Which, you know, you could three bait and call whatever. Flop comes queen jack 10, giving you a gut shot. You can just fold you can get out of the way whenever someone bets. It's okay. But if you have any sort of pair in that scenario, you definitely can't fold. If you have an ace, eh, like say an ace five suited, which again, you should probably three bet, but if you didn't three bet it, it's, if you have a backdoor flush draw, you probably want to be sticking around. Someone's banging on my wall. Hopefully that's not a, hopefully there's not a problem. The Selling and Nolan Holden audiobook is fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It took me forever to read it. Is it better to know the Equilibrium or GTO? I'm not even sure what you are referring to here. I think GTO strategies are Equilibrium strategies, aren't they? Um, do I prefer tournaments or cash games and why? I like mixing it up. I think variety is the spice of life. You need to experiment, try new things, change it up. If you do the same thing all day, every day, that is um, fine for a while, but you'll find that you get burnt out. For a lot of people, though, they get to play poker like once a week. In that case, you probably have a preference. And to be fair, if you're rarely playing, you should probably stick to exactly one format. But I've had periods in my life where I played tons of cash games, and I've had periods in life where I played tons of tournaments. I suppose in theory, I prefer tournaments because that's what I end up playing. But I have, I have like, a, I like playing cash games, so I don't know if I necessarily prefer either. Let's see. Polly says, are you saying that if you don't have the range advantage on the flop, you should not continuation bet as often? That is correct. When you lack the range advantage, you should be doing a whole lot of checking in theory. That's not what we're talking about today. But I do have a video on YouTube, when to continuation bet and how much. James has a good question. Should you continuation bet ace-king on an 876 board? And the answer is almost certainly not. However, the number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros says you should. And I actually think that is perfectly fine. Say you do raise and big blind calls and it comes 876 and you have ace king. Yeah, you're not probably supposed to be doing a whole lot of checking here. 765 is uh actually is it 765 or 654? 654, I think, is the uh, best board for the big blind. 765 is pretty bad as well for for the pre-flop raiser. Um as the board gets higher, like 10, 9, 8, that actually becomes okay for the pre-flop raiser because they have lots of straights, two pair sets, etc. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Should you continuation bet the ace king on 8, 7, 6? Probably not. Well, almost certainly not from a GTO point of view, but we're not trying to play GTO. We're exploiting the opponents. Opponents fold too much, just bet small and win the pot. And if they raise, you fold. You don't have anything, right? Recognize ace king is not a good hand on those boards. What's my best book for sit-and-go strategies? I don't have a book on sit-and-go strategies because uh, you can't really win money at the high stakes and sit-and-goes anymore. That said, mastering small stakes no limit hold'em. Recognize, though, you need to study ICM a lot. Beautiful example of um, adjusting to your opponents is there are many scenarios where if your opponents play according to ICM, you can jam very, very wide because they should be folding a lot, right? But if they call more often, well, you don't get to jam nearly as often. I'm actually writing a chapter in my next book, Excelling in Tough No Limit Holding Games, where uh, there's a spot where you can open jam something like 60% of hands if your opponents 
call in accordance to ICM, but you can only jam like 8% of hands if they call off with um, more reasonable hands, reasonable hands, like ace-king and ace-queen and pocket eights, which many people do not fold even for a 15 big blind jam. And it's because it, it, it's, it's relevant, right? ICM is very, very relevant. And uh, if when people do not adhere to it, it costs you and them. So you can't jam as wide. So you have to know what your opponents are up to. Do not think that you can just mindlessly follow charts and win. If you think you can just run a poker scenario through a solver without actively putting in your opponent's strategy, you are making a big, big error. KCAP said, you finally move up to Poker Coaching Premium, and now you're buried in new content. Good stuff. Yeah, there's um, essentially infinite content in Poker Coaching Premium, which some people are complaining about, which I thought was interesting. But realize that you do not have to consume all content that I release, which is an important thing. It's easy to have information overload. You see all these books right here? I'm supposed to read these. I also have a little pile down there, too. I'm supposed to read all these books, and um, I say supposed to, but it's like I want to, but I don't have necessarily enough time at the moment. And um, it's, it's tough. It's tough to deal with information overload, especially if you are a hoarder of knowledge like I am. What's ICM? ICM is the individual chip model. Check out a program, ICMizer. JonathanLillPoker.com slash ICM, I think will take you right there. Are you supposed to always add on in tournaments? Um, no. Depends on the, the value, right? Let's see. Is there a video on ICM? Go to YouTube, search Jonathan Little ICM. I'm sure something will come right up. Let's see. Are these still relevant? Um, for short stacked games, I think they're fine, but most games are not that short stacked anymore. Let's see. Ron says, you're very supposed to say you won the tournament at MGM Detroit on the 13th. Thanks to my material. Good job. Good work. I'm glad to hear you're having good success. That's my favorite poker book to read on my shelf. Modern Poker Theory is my favorite book at the moment, but to be fair, I helped write it. It's not my content. I just helped put it together. It's a fantastic book. Modern Poker Theory. Does C-bet sizing need to be bigger out of position, or can we get away with always betting a third pot on boards that favor your range? Giorgio, I'm saying you can bet a third pot in literally every scenario. Maybe even 25% pot in every scenario. It's okay. It's not optimal, and it probably is losing money compared to a much more in-depth thinking strategy. But again, today we're discussing the number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. But you, um, in general, you should be betting bigger when you're betting with a more polarized range. And when you're out of position, you usually want to be continuation betting less frequently, which implies that you are continuation betting with a more polarized range. So you're frequently bet, if you're trying to play GTO or just, you know, good fundamentally sound poker in, in most scenarios, um, you essentially want to bet bigger when you're betting with a more polarized range or the board is better for your opponent, which is the case when you're betting with a more polarized range. So that's going to result in you betting less frequently but bigger. How do I study for my poker tournaments? I consume infinite content. I work with many players of all skill levels. I work with coaches of all skill levels. And I, I see a lot of content. I have a few people I outsource work to, um, and and that that makes it to where I don't have to do a lot of the nitty gritty grinding, running pro, running simulations on my own because they all do it for me. I'm in a good spot in life because <laughs> uh, people people like working with me. It's important to make people like working with you. People don't like working with you. Life's gonna be tough. This is something I did not recognize a long time ago. I was like horribly in my shell. I was a negative pessimistic person, pessimistic, pessimistic person. And that was certainly not ideal. And I don't know when, when the switch flipped, but it, it changed to where uh, I, I tried, tried to be positive and tried to help others as opposed to only helping myself. And once that happened, life just got a whole lot better. I was happier, I had more opportunities. People wanted to work with me and it's, it's, it's good to help others. When you help others, 
Turns out they want to help you as well. Uh, let's see. Can't get enough of my content. <laughs> well, good. Should, I, should you ever fold to a min 3-bet before the flop? Probably not. It's a good example of this in the World Series main event this last year. Someone tried to angle shoot me where I raised... And then they, like, men re-raised by accident. By accident. It wasn't by accident. They had, I'm pretty sure they had aces or kings. Um, I had ace six offsuit. <laughs> and the flop came, like, eight six six. And we ended up getting in all of our money. He didn't show his hand for some reason. I'm just sitting here thinking about it. How did he not show his hand? I won a ton of money off of him. And, um... Maybe I like bet flop, bet turn, bet river. So maybe I didn't stack him. Maybe it was more like pre-flop I raised button. He min re-raised like big blind or small blind. I called the a6, which is an awful hand. Awful hand. Awful, awful, awful hand. You're going to be so dominated every time and uh, it's terrible. All right. But facing the min re-raise, I, I was getting like whatever it is, seven to one pre-flop pot odds. And I have position and we're deep. So whatever, if I drill the trip sixes or maybe a pair, I stick around and eh, it's dicey. Anyway. It came like 866. He bet I raised pretty big. He called. Turn with some blank. I bet big. He called. River some blank. I bet big. He called. That's probably how I didn't get to see his hand. But um, that's fun. Did I see a betting blunder of someone on a show? No, I did not. I don't watch a whole lot of streams. Um, most of the streams I watch are to make content out of them. But no, I did not see it. How do you know that a poker player is a professional? Does it have to be solid play? Mm. Well, most people you can know are at least competent by the way they handle themselves at the table, the way they act, the way they bet, their overall strategies. So um, how do you know? I don't know if you ever really know. Someone's phone's going off out there. Um, how do you go from a uh, cup half empty to a cup half full? It's a tough, tough mental shift that you have to make. And I, I wish I had the answer, but I don't really have the answer. I somehow woke up and realized I was not happy with my life. And I realized that other people were having opportunities that I was not. And it's because I was in my shell and not actively trying to help others, right? And if you're just in your shell doing your own thing... With like being without trying to benefit others, why would they want to work with you? You have no, they have no reason to want to work with you because you're you're not helping anyone. And so, I think it actually stemmed from just starting to listen to podcasts a long time ago. I've been listening to podcasts for like ten years now, um, before they were even a, a popular thing, and just listening to people who are out there helping other people was very very influential i think but like it's not like i heard one thing and all of a sudden a, a switch fl switch flipped but it was more of over time you just recognize that it is the right way to go about doing things it's much better to build up the community than tear it down and unfortunately a lot of people in a lot of game spaces uh they try to tear others down they think that's what they're supposed to do they ever play poker in sacramento I played at Stones quite a few times. I played at Mike Paso once that I don't even remember. That was on Veronica and Friends. Veronica got me drunk, so I didn't even remember Apostles at the table. I've played at Thunder Valley. It's great. No, poker's great in Sacramento. Do you think online poker is going to end in the near future? Definitely not in the near future. Who am I, Jonathan Little? You can search Jonathan Little. I think I have a Wikipedia page. All right, one thing you start to realize is that rec players don't respect one-third of continuation bets or down bets and wrongly see weakness in them. Okay. So, Giorgio, if that's what you think your opponents do, if they view small bets as weak, what does that mean? Well, are they going to view your turn bet as weak? Are they going to view your river bet as weak? So if they're going to call a small bet frequently or raise a small bet frequently, you should adjust to betting perhaps 40% pot with your bluffs and 25% pot with your nuts. And then you're just going to maximally exploit them. Our Galloway says, realize that we have one life. There's nothing to do after you die. Grow up and take full advantage of every moment. Yeah, it's true. You got to gotta make the most of your situation. How do you slow down in middle position when you miss? You just check. 
You're allowed to check. Don't forget that you should be checking a decent amount of the time. What's the correct way to play a small PP? I guess you mean a pair. Against an unknown player's raise in the three bet, you just fold your small pairs. Easy fold. Easy fold. Where can you practice heads up? Any online poker site for the most part. Let's see. Veronica says, LOL, I, you had fun. I did have fun. I think I lost a bunch of money. I remember against the guy, I think his name's Frank. I had top pair, I think, against Frank's two pair. And somehow we like played for all the money. Like $3,000 at, uh, at, one, at one three games. That was fun. <laughs> Whenever you have the next Veronica and Friends game, let me know. I'll come. All right. Podcast for influential view as well. Yeah, I love podcasts. Our gallery says, Veronica is so dreamy. Indeed, indeed. Um, do I want a poker coaching hat? You know, I don't really wear hats for whatever reason. But hey, if you're a poker coaching member and you want to get some patches, like this one here on the wall over here, um, we can mail those to you. Send us a message, support at pokercoaching.com, and we'll get it to you. Am I going to go play to Resort World Cat Skills? No. Not unless they have a big tournament. How long of a winning streak have I had? I don't even know. I don't think like that. I think uh, more in terms of... I don't even think about, like, luck. Because when you go and you play, you either win or you lose, and you go home. Who cares, right? I don't care about results. And you may say, how do you not care about results? Well, I've played enough to realize the results don't really matter all that much. Oh, yeah, there was a hand where I played against Possible where uh, it, was, it was a fun one. I think it went, like, limp, 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 or raise, call, 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 and I three-bet, like, king eight suited or something. Possible cold call jacks. Pulls back around to someone who jammed it all in for, like, $600. I re-raised all in because I thought I was in good shape. Turns out she had the 9-8 offsuit, so my king eight was in great shape. But then Possible got me with the jacks. Maybe I should sue him. I don't think he was on God mode yet. When can you expect more Lexi Gavin content? Every month, we've hired a few new coaches at PokerCoaching.com. We've hired uh, Jonathan Jaffe, who I think is one of the absolute best players in the world. We hired Lexi Gavin, who is a fantastic tournament and cash game player. And um, she also helps with charity series of poker, which I think is a, they do great work. And um, she's going to be making content on a regular basis. I think she she's turned down, I think, four quizzes and a class so far. So it's... She's turning in more and more work. That's what they're supposed to do. Every month, the coaches make more content. <laughs> so we can expect it every month. How do I feel about the Heartland Poker Tour? I don't know much about it. I've never played on it. The cab was flowing. Yes. I love Cabernet. How do you slow down from middle position when you open and miss with a hand like 10-9 suited? Check fold when you have nothing. We discuss this thoroughly at PokerCoaching.com. Bet with your best made hands and your draws in every scenario. And... Um, if you don't have a best made hand or draw, you have to be asking, do you have a range advantage? If you have a range advantage, you could probably bet with it and then get out of the way. 10-9 suited is a great hand because usually it has something. Usually it has overcards or backdoor flush draw or something. So you're supposed to be betting with it. You don't want to slow down with your, your draws. Turns out, Jesse says, you found out that you screw up with your draws and it plugged one of your largest leaks. Fantastic. Uh, I have some videos over the last... I decided to make four videos for a weekly poker hand using poker snowy and um you all seem to be liking it. maybe i'll do more how do you act when you see a bad player offering coaching services for money i don't react this is a free market if someone can coach get someone to pay money for their coaching services it is what it is and i don't have a problem with that obviously i don't think it's good a good thing to be doing, especially if you're bad. I mean, I remember there's this guy in Vegas all the time who was going around like handing out cards to people for, for coaching at, at Bellagio. And this guy was awful. And I'm mean, like, whatever, what are you going to do? Do I wear shades at the poker table? No. I used to all the time. Then I realized, going back to getting out of my shell, that sunglasses, headphones, hoodies, all of that are quite bad for getting people to interact with you and for you to interact with others. And going back to, you know, trying to help others and be someone they want at your table because you're fun. Um, sunglasses are the exact opposite of fun, in my opinion. Who do we choose? How do we choose how to back 
in the monthly poker coaching uh, backing contest that I do. Every month, for those who don't know, we've been backing some people. Louis Philippe's here. Just asked me a question. He um, cashed in the World Poker Tour 500. I think he played day two kind of soon. Good luck in that. What's my criteria? I want people who are doing their homework. I want people who are doing their quizzes. I have all this data. I know who's doing their homework and who's doing their quizzes. I look for good homework answers. If you do poor homework challenge answers, you're probably not going to get backed. If you're doing good work, you might get backed. If you're here in a little coffee and interacting, if you're commenting with thoughtful comments, if you're engaged and working hard, those are the people I'm going to be backing. I'm not just going to back someone who says, give me some money, I'm good at poker. Because I don't know. You've shown me no proof, right? But some people are out there showing me proof, and I'm happy to happy to help them. Jonathan Jaffe's classes are good so far. Yes. Jonathan Jaffe is one of the best poker players in the world. He actually used to make training videos for me about 15 years ago. How about that? Was it 15 years ago? No, it was more like 12 or 10 years ago. I don't know. 10 years ago, let's, let's say it. How often he asked John? I don't know what you all are saying. Clearly, you can see all these. These uh, you have to type more than just one line about something that happened in the past because I can't. Um, I can't uh, remember things very well. <laughs> Which homework should you start with? The early ones or the recent ones? I suggest you go back to the very, very first one, and then work your way forward. It's going to take a lot of time. Each one's going to take you about an hour. The first ones are very basic, just discussing like pre-flop ranges, but it builds from there. And if you can just hop into the newest ones and be okay, then then go for it. But I think a lot of people are going to find they have problems with that, so just start at the earliest and work your way forward. There are instructions for how to do the homework right in the homework tab, so make sure you watch the instructions so that you don't waste your time, essentially. You are not a paying poker coaching member. Should you upgrade first and then ask for backing? Listen, if you are not a paying poker coaching member, you're probably not going to get picked. Also, that like that's a perk for being a member. Also... If you are not a paying member, it means you have not done the homework, which means I'm probably not going to be backing you. If you have not gone through the 600 quizzes, probably not going to be backing you, right? Is Jared Gavin doing so? I don't know. I don't think Jared Gavin's doing work for me. Unless that's someone who I do not know. Jared. Oh, wait, maybe. I don't know. Jared Gavin, Jared Gavin, Jared Gavin. It's, I, I, may, I may only know him by his internet name. I'm sorry, I don't even know who works for me anymore. <laughs> uh, let's see, does Poker Snowy apply to poker tournaments? It applies for dollar EV, well, chip EV scenario. So essentially the answer is no, but it um, it's very useful because you can extrapolate from it, right? Same thing with solvers. The solvers don't account for payout implications yet. Some people think that they should blindly follow them, which is a huge mistake. Actually, the most recent um, poker coaching webinar, I explained why you want to be deviating from uh, pile software because in tournaments, you really want to minimize the chances that you go broke, whereas the solvers don't care if you go broke because you can just reload, right? Um, what about sunglasses in a tournament? I, I just told all of you I do not wear the sunglasses. What's your recommendations for playing live poker the first time? Realize you're going to be out of your comfort zone. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be excited. And um, just go and have fun. Play smaller stakes than normal and enjoy yourself. You get to play only once every other month. Find simple strategies that work, like what we discussed today, right? The number one tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros is just a continuation bet small. And then keep betting the turn with your best made hands and your draws, and you're just going to be crushing your opponents. Well, crushing your opponents. You're going to be um, hurting your opponents, that's for sure. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jared is God. Is Jared God's big toe? If he's God's big toe, then yes, he does great work. See, I know it by, by the online name. There you go, God's big toe. Yeah, he does good work. They do Sunday or Saturday study sessions on Twitch. So follow him on Twitch, and on Saturday they go through poker coaching quizzes. Jaffe's overbetting video is superb. All of Jaffe's content is superb. He coaches many of the absolute biggest winners in poker, and he is one of the biggest winners in poker. And um, it's great. If you're not a premium member, do you still look at the quiz and homework? Not a premium member. 
Not sure what you're saying, Polly. Mr. Blam Blamo, welcome. Glad you found me. It's good to, good for people to find you. All right, let's see. Lots and lots of talking about random stuff today. Somehow we've gotten off topic. How do you order training? Go to pokercoaching.com. Questions about subscriptions? Send an email, support at pokercoaching.com. Suggestions for optimizing your study time. This is a difficult thing because you have to figure out what works for you, right? And I mentioned this earlier. Don't get overwhelmed by the amount of content that I or other people produce. You need to be studying the things that you enjoy, the things that you like. And if you study in a way that you enjoy, you're going to be way more likely to continue studying, right? As opposed to forcing yourself to do something like read a book. If you don't like reading books, you probably shouldn't be reading books. If you don't like um, sitting and running simulations on your computer, don't sit there and run simulations on your computer, especially if your time is limited. Um, so I would tell you to find what you enjoy and then do that. Now, if it's, make sure what you're doing is actually educational, right? I know a lot of people just enjoy having a beer and watching a poker stream, but that's definitely not the most educational thing you can do at all. Probably like the worst thing you can do because people are not giving good thought processes on why they are doing what they are doing. And also a lot of streams are just kind of like hangouts. Now, look, I have nothing against streaming. I think it's good. If you're watching streams like God Big, God's Big Toe stream, where he's actually studying, it's probably way better for you than watching someone goof off and play medium stakes tournaments online. Some of the people who stream have made it very clear that they actually play poorly on purpose because they're getting paid by some site and they want to make sure that their opponents don't actually know how they play when they're not streaming. That's uh, not cool in my book, but that's what some people do because they don't actually care about their fans. So anyway, obviously some streamers are fine. Don't take this out of context. People love taking what I say out of context. Oh my God, they love it. Don't do that. It makes you a fish. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Where are we going with this? Yeah, study study what works for you. I've made pokercoaching.com to have a lot of facets to it. We have the quizzes, which are basically playing poker. A lot of people actually like playing poker, right? So we made the quizzes where it was like playing poker. Also, um... We have the homework challenges. A lot of people don't like the homework challenges. Why? Because it's hard. It takes time. It takes a little bit of diligence. It's, it's difficult. And people don't like that. People don't like hard work. But it is hard work. But, I mean, in theory, the things that are going to make you better are doing the things that are a little bit more difficult. So if I had to tell you exactly what to do, I would tell you to get Poker Coaching Premium, watch the Cash Game Masterclass. It's about six hours long. It's going to give you all the tools you need to succeed at medium and deep stack poker. Shallow stack poker is usually a little bit easier to learn. So if you learn medium and deep stack, you're going to be fine. And then go through all of the homework challenges, starting at the earliest and going up to the most current. It's going to take you a lot of time. It's going to take you like 50 hours. But it'll make you significantly better at poker. That is what I would suggest you do. If you've not read Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, the tournament master class or the cash game master class is kind of like that. Not exactly, but kind of. Okay. A lot of bad players are on YouTube telling you the best way to play. Yeah, that's accurate. A lot of people have um, ideas for the ways that poker should be played. And a lot of them are just straight up wrong. Some people think it's a pure feel game where you just go play by the seat of your pants and see what happens. Probably not optimal. Some people think you need to study solvers and never deviate from them. Probably not optimal. Um, from talking to literally the best players in the world on a regular basis, they all pretty much do the same thing. They exactly what they do. They learn game theory optimal strategies, and they learn how to adjust to beat the opponents they play against. A lot of people stop at step one. A lot of people who think they're good stop at step one without... Go into step two. Step two is vitally important, and it's going to make you a big winner as opposed to a small winner. And it's it's hard it's hard to maximally exploit your opponents because you never really know it, when you should be deviating and when you should not be deviating because you don't know if something's actually wrong or not actually wrong, and um, it's tough. But pretty much all the best players subscribe to exactly that methodology. Not all of them, but the vast majority of them. And the nice thing about that is that strategy is replicatable. Some players who don't do a whole lot of studying but crush, 
Like, uh, Brent Kenny, for example, says he doesn't do much studying at all. He just shows up and crushes. Well, realize Brent Kenny's played probably more poker than almost anyone in the world. And um, he has infinite amount of experience, and he's very, very smart. And probably very, very naturally talented. And that's not so replicatable. It is replicatable, though, to study the most common spots. It's only, like, 500 of them. And then, once you know how to play those very common 500 spots, from a game theory alpha point of view, learn how to adjust. And you should be learning to adjust as you go. Don't think it's like, learn GTO, then learn how to adjust. It's more like, learn a strategy for a spot, and then figure out how to adjust to take advantage of... Um, Take advantage of those scenarios. Is it mandatory to say some cash game tournaments if one only plays a tournament? Or cash game strategies if one only plays tournaments? You need to learn how to play deep stacked poker. Realize deep stacked poker is very often what you are playing at the beginning of tournaments. So you need to know how to play deep stacked poker. What is your take on the player from Sweden, Fedor? Fedor is great. We have two pieces of content from Fedor Holtz on pokercoaching.com in the premium section, I think. Check that out. Premium is easily the best content you've seen in the last five content that you've seen in the last five years. Well, thank you. That was the goal. I think Fedor's great. Definitely a genius. Are cash games and tournaments actually that different? Oh no, difference between regular cash games and fast fold cash games like Zoom Poker. Um, you're gonna typically want to be playing closer to GTO strategies and Zoom Poker because you have fewer reads. Um, so GTO strategy, again, adjusting to the typical player pool. Polly says over 200 people are watching. Hit that thumbs up. Yes, hit thumbs up, hit like, hit subscribe, hit whatever the buttons are. That goes a long way to helping me help other people. Is GTO really necessary to understand for micro stakes? Learning how to play well is necessary for all games because if you don't know how to play well, you don't know how to adjust to take advantage of your opponents. And also, you're not going to know how to, how to progress up. Right? Yeah, also, Fedor's not from Sweden. <laughs> I think he's from Germany. Pretty sure. All right, all right, all right, all right. Thanks for all my insights. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Enjoy it. Smash the like button, people. Don't break the like, bu like button. Hit it, hit it gently. Hit it gently. It's okay to be gentle. For those who are showing up late, to reiterate, number one, tournament poker strategy to crush non-pros. Continuation bet, small and frequently. Small and frequently. Any tilting tips? Well, realize when you are betting small and frequently, you're going to start winning and losing more medium-sized pots. Now, to be fair, whenever you were perhaps raising and then continuation betting with a big strategy, uh, a big bet size, man, I can't talk today. I apologize. This is what happens when I'm hungover. Can't get English together. Whenever you're continuation betting using a big bet size, what happens is the pots become very, very big. And a, a tip for tournaments, which is what we're discussing today, is that you don't really want to be playing for all of your money, right? This is something that a lot of people who subscribe to solvers, this is something they completely ignore, and it costs them loads of equity. Very often, you want to be doing a bit more checking and a bit more betting small in tournaments than the solvers will recommend because... You don't want to be just firing out big bluffs over and over and over again, even if they are profitable. It's important to realize that just because a play is profitable does not mean that it is necessarily good, and the solver, solvers will suggest you making all sorts of bluffs and all sorts of value bets that are marginally profitable. And you have to figure out how to adjust. And typically what it amounts to is just playing a little bit more defensive strategy on uh, once the pot becomes very big. Let's see. Yeah, if you have world class instincts and good thought process, and maybe you don't need to do stuff, maybe you don't need to study. Yeah, perhaps. But recognize that uh, that's not most people. I have no good natural poker instincts. So I want to make that perfectly clear. When I first started playing poker, I was bad. I was weak. I was tight. I was nitty. I didn't put a chip in the pot without the nuts. I was bad. And. I lost for a little bit in small stakes games when I learned, right? And I studied a ton. Long time ago, I had a job. I was working in an airport making $10 per hour. And I took $50, put it into party poker. But before I did that, I actually bought, I think, about 10 poker books. I remember I spent $300 on poker books. Um, they were all on Limit Hold'em. That was the game that was played back in the day. 
and I studied a lot before I ever even played for the $50 buy-in because I was tight and nitty. I guess my parents were always somewhat frugal and they taught me being frugal is optimal, which I don't even know if that's necessarily true, but I, um, I definitely did not like losing money. So I was very, very, very nitty. But I studied. Before I even played, I studied. And that's how I've always approached any, any game is by studying. Have I considered poker coaching meetup games? Yes. The problem is it's hard to do that type of thing because I don't know when I'm going to be available. Uh, we tinkered with it during the World Series. What I found works for me is breakfast. The students loved the breakfast. We had, um, I was at Borgata the other day. We had a breakfast with about 15 people there. At the World Series this year, we had two breakfasts. that had like 40 people each time. A whole load of people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you're a poker coaching member, we do meetups. And in terms of games, the games are hard, like I said. Because like when I'm out there playing poker, I'm playing poker tournaments on a regular basis. And I have no time where I know I'm going to be free. And that makes it hard to plan that type of thing for me. Like during the World Series, it basically means I need to have multiple days off, right? So I, it means I have to skip two or three tournaments to know I'm going to be free on a specific day. How long does it take to have some comfort in those 500 spots? 30 minutes each one, 15 minutes each one, something like that. Was I in the ship at Halabalas? I was. There's a book on us. I think it's called Here Come the Ship at Halabalas. My name is Fiery Justice in there. You'd love some content showing how poker has changed. Poker's changed significantly. What are the Ship at Halabalas? Ship at Halabalas was a group of young players who uh, had too much money and uh, not enough sense. Players included myself, uh, Dave Benefield. He was kind of the leader. Andrew Roble. I guess he was also kind of the leader. Tom Guan. Phil Galfond. Mario Silvestri. Kevin Boudreau. I'm sure I'm skipping. I'm sure I'm missing some people. Anyway. Oh, the good old days. When do you find a time find time to play having kids? I don't play when I'm at home. I instead play when I'm traveling. Turns out, all those poker players, the ship at Halabalas, who wanted to stay in poker, turns out we all became pretty good at poker. Some of us wanted to get out of poker, and we didn't. Oh, uh, Peter Jetton. Yeah, Peter Jetton, Max Greenfield. Wait, what's his, his last name, Greenfield? That doesn't sound right. Greenwood, Max Greenwood. Uh, you all may know Sam Greenwood, who's a crusher now. That's his, one of his younger brothers. He has two younger twin brothers who are both great at poker, Sam and Lucas. Anyway, Max. So anyway, the good old days, the good old days. Do you ever see yourself retiring from poker? Uh, probably not. But I mean, like, what does retiring mean, you know? Because in theory, I've kind of retired. I'm not playing all day every day like I used to. So if I'm not playing all day every day, am I retired? I don't even know. I mean, I produce educational content for all of you all the time. So I don't feel like I'm retired. How much time do you spend playing poker now? I play about one week a month. And when I play poker one week a month, I'm playing very, very hard. You're saying are the Greenwoods triplets? No, there are two twin. There are twins. And then Max is the older brother. Sam and Lucas are twins. Max is the older brother. What happened to 3-Bet Clothing? I don't know. I guess they ran out of money. <laughs> Whenever a company runs out of money, they either have to raise more money or they have to close up shop. And it's important to know when to cut your losses. Vitally important in business and life and poker, etc., to not have the sunk cost fallacy of thinking that I've already invested X amount in this, therefore I must continue investing in this. And... A lot of people are really bad at that. For some of you, you maybe need to cut your losses on poker and pack it up. For some of you, maybe it's degenerate gambling. Maybe it's some um, specific friends. Maybe you have friends who are negative impacts on your life. I don't know, but there are things in everyone's life that they should probably get off of. And it's vitally important to recognize that and not be afraid of the time you have invested. Um, and realize that just because you're getting off something for now doesn't mean you're saying no for forever. It means I'm saying no for now. For me, this was Magic the Gathering. I love playing Magic the Gathering. But I knew when I had kids three years ago that I was going to have to put Magic the Gathering on hold until the kids can read. Then we're going to play Magic all the time. 
But I recognize that. And I'm not saying goodbye for forever. I'm saying goodbye for now. And if something is negatively impacting your life or if something is a huge drain on your time or attention or money or whatever, you probably need to get rid of that. What do I think of Daniel Grandu's small ball style? I think playing small pots is very ideal in tournaments. That said, there's also times we be betting big with a polarized range. So I think always playing small pots is not ideal. I also think always playing big pots is not ideal. That's not how poker works. You want to play a fundamentally sound strategy. The charges are quit playing Magic Gathering a year and a half ago after playing for five years. Yeah, I started playing when I was 12. Now I'm 34. 22 years. <laughs> Would you throw a day sign offsuit? Less than 30 big blinds in position. Your friends say no, but you're not convinced. Uh, you can do that. It's a good, good blocker hand. The WPT final table I made against Phil Ivey. Was that my first time playing against him? I don't know. I don't know. don't remember. I do remember, though. Um, Phil Ivey was on my left in the tournament, and when we're down to, like, I think it was 18 people. He was on my left, and he was three-betting me every single hand. And I knew my friend Tom Guan was playing a lot against him, heads up. And Tom's very smart and good at poker. And has a very non, a no, very no-nonsense way of thinking about things. He's like, well, just start four-betting every time. Like, easy answer. If he's three-betting a lot, just start four-betting a lot. So I kept raising. He kept three-betting. I just kept jamming. I did it, like, five times. And uh, just folds, 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 folds. Can I read your message? No, I'm not going to scroll up through here and find your message. Realize we have a stream going on. It's not all about your message. If I missed it, sorry. There are many, many people here. Well, I let my kids win at Magic. Um, yeah, probably. It's important to make sure that people have good experiences when they play. A lot of people forget the concept of make sure your opponents have fun. I actually messed this up with my wife. I introduced Magic in a relatively difficult way. So I like playing a very, very interactive game. Whereas, basically I ruined the game for her because I introduced it very poorly. And I'm sure she'll go back and try again one day, but we don't have any time now. But I, I messed that up. And I'm not going to mess it up with my kids. Do you have a Black Lotus? I have one Black Lotus. It is signed and altered by Christopher Rush, the artist. I love altered cards. I love art. Art is very important to me. I say it's very important to me. I don't know if it's very important to me, but I enjoy it. How about that? I just enjoy art. Do you guys care about what's going on in the world? Oh boy. Here we may have to ban somebody. All right. That's going to be it for today. Hope you all have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Again, number one tip. Continuation bet. Small and frequently. Small and frequently. Red, black, white deck is always the best. No, that's just not true. You must play blue. Otherwise, you're probably messing up. All right. Have a good day. Be a positive impact on someone. Do something nice. And make the most out of your time. Bye-bye.